So we always have people dialing in from around the world. So Alex, welcome. Hello from uh, Jennifer in Arizona, Mike here in Las Vegas, uh, Columbus, Ohio. Jennifer, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are gonna get started because I do know we have a jam-packed hour and um, let's go ahead and we're gonna hit the recording. And so good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you're at in the world. Uh, today, we're really excited today to have Claire Axelrad with us to teach us and educate us on Amp Up Your Appeals, Persuasive Power with Research from Psychology and Neuroscience. Uh, again, introduce yourself. We have a fabulous nonprofit community that is engaging. Ask questions of your peers in that chat function. And um, one of the other things we are recording, so you will receive a copy of the, a link to the recording as well as a copy of the slides. And then if you have questions for Claire as we go, you wanna um, dig into anything, use, please use the Q&A tab within your console to ask that question. I can see them all line up and I can mark them off as you answer them. That's a lot easier for us if you have a very specific question you wanna ask. Again, engage with your peers in the chat, ask, use the Q&A for the, Q, the question and answer with Claire. Follow along on Twitter if you're so inclined. And with that, I wanna just quick jump in to, well, welcome. My name's Ann Feldman. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Bloomerang. And what's Bloomerang? Bloomerang is all about creating, making fundraising easier, creating authentic donor relationships and helping nonprofits thrive. And we do that through the Bloom, our Bloomerang software, which is donor relationship management. Some of you might hear the term CRM. Those are different uh, terms to refer to the software. This is a quick little screenshot. Don't go there right now though. You can learn about that after the fact. Um, but we are all about helping uh, nonprofits thrive and raise more funds. But today we are going to learn from Claire. And so I want to just quickly introduce Claire because she has been a longtime partner with Bloomerang. And why is that? Because Claire is a seasoned and very successful uh, you know, development career that she's had in nonprofit. She is very inspiring. She's also uh, the brains behind our Ask an Expert series that we put out. Um, Claire's earned the uh, AFP Outstanding Fundraising Professional of the Year Award. Uh, she's coaching and teaching. She has the Clarification School. It's been called one of the best bargain in fundraising. There is so much to learn from Claire. She's also a featured expert. Um, again, like I said, for Bloomerang, she's going to be our guide today, and um, we are going to jump in. She, Claire is also, she's very accomplished, a member of the California State Bar and graduate of Princeton University. She, we were talking earlier, she is in San Francisco, and uh, she loves craft fairs, baseball games, art openings, vocal and guitar, political conversation, uh, so just, uh, oh, you know, someone that you'll love getting to know today. So Claire, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and pass the mic to you and let's get going. Okay, here we go. All right. So I'm, I'm, thank you all for joining us. I'm really excited to talk about this issue because too often we do things because we're told to or we're copying what we did last year, or we're copying what someone else did, but we don't know why we're including or excluding particular content in our messaging and calls to action. We've just been told to put it in or to take it out, or it seems right because we've seen it elsewhere. And this is what I call working blindly, and it can lead to accidentally removing the most persuasive part of your appeal. So it really helps to learn about what influences decision making. So you give your fundraising offer a fighting chance. And research reveals how much principles of psychology and neuroscience influence donor choices. So today I'm going to share some of my favorite tricks to incline donors to say yes to offers they simply won't want to refuse. And in, I want to say these are not manipulations. They're just smart research-based tools 
that savvy fundraisers should be using to improve messaging and calls to action. And if you use them, you'll be ahead of the curve. So before I tell you why this has been important and why now more than ever, a little bit about me, you already got most of this, but I just wanna say that I have been in your shoes for 30 years. I was a director of development and marketing. I've been doing this a while and I have written a lot of online and offline appeals and newsletter articles, annual reports, grant proposals, major gift pitches, you name it. And I've learned over time that some things work really well to get to yes and others not so much. So today I'm going to share 10 of my favorite principles of influence and persuasion. I could talk about this for a full day, but I don't want to leave any of the good stuff out. So we're going to go at a rapid clip and I want you to think of these 10 things as buttons to push. And we all know that pushing someone's button is designed to get a strong emotional reaction from them. And when you put these buttons into play in your appeals, they work as decision-making shortcuts for your prospective donors, and they incline them to accept your offer. So let's look at them one at a time. I'll explain the strategy and then give you a few tips, both for online and offline fundraising and marketing. And then you can go back to work and riff on this and come up with some more. So the first one is reciprocity. People are wired this way. If you do someone a favor, they tend to feel indebted to you. They wanna pay you back. And this is the ultimate reason that great customer service and donor service has such a fantastic return on investment. It's the top reason customers become repeat customers. And there's a psychologist named Norbert Schwartz who found in a 1987 study, it doesn't take much to start the process of reciprocity. Even the smallest of favors allows goodwill to be bought and that increases loyalty and retention. So let's look at some of this research. So, this study was done where in the course of a day, they occasionally placed a dime on a copy machine for the next user to find. Later, everyone who used the machine that day was interviewed about their lives. And those who found the dime reported being happier and more satisfied and wanted to change their lives less than those who didn't find a dime. So it's not the value of the favor, it's that something positive happened, pleasantly surprised you and made you grateful. There's another cool study where people leaving a grocery store were asked to evaluate their satisfaction with their TVs back home. And those who minutes earlier were given a free sample of lemon pound cake from the store said they liked their TVs better than those who missed the sample. And this is because they got a shot of dopamine to their brain's pleasure center when eating the pound cake and they felt more positive, more generous, more grateful. And it only works because the person's not aware that they're happy because they found a dime or got some cake. And if you think hard, you realize that's a really silly reason to feel good. So if you go back to your powers that be in your office and say, well, we ought to try something like this. And of course, we'll, I'll give you some ideas of how you would do this in fundraising. They might say, oh, that's ridiculous. They're gonna try to talk you out of it. Don't let them because donors are not gonna stop and analyze these things. They'll simply feel good because you did something nice for them. And that inclines them to do something nice for you. Here is a book that I, I commend to you by Jay Baer. It's called Utility. And basically it's the principle of helping people not selling to them. If you can think about what, what would be in this for the donor rather than constantly promoting all the time, then you're gonna put yourself in a much better position. So 
one thing you can do is simply make someone responsible for donor service um, and customer experience. You want to create an organization-wide culture of philanthropy, which is another subject unto itself. But basically, it boils down to, if the receptionist is nice to me, I'm going to give when I get your appeal. So think about the useful gifts that you can give people that might help them. Um, so offline favors are things like uh, uh, front end premiums. If you ever wondered why direct mailers send free address labels, calendars, note cards, it's because it works. It's not for everyone, but it does work for plenty. And even if you don't do large scale direct mailings, you can apply this principle by including useful how to information in your mailed newsletters and as inserts in thank you letters. I wouldn't put it in your appeal, it's distracting. But you know, if you're a social service agency, 10 ways to keep seniors safe, T tips for taking toddlers to the zoo, seven tips for planning a perfect museum date, environmental organization, 22 ways to save your planet. You've got this stuff just hanging around. You can also send token gifts, um, like a coffee coupon from one of your sponsors, or if you have a cafe on site from there. Uh, one thing I've done is put a stick of gum in a thank you letter. It doesn't cost any more to mail it and say, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, online favors are uh, little gifts. Little gifts are like links to how-to videos or recommended reading lists or white papers with research that you've done, names and contact info to make it easy for people to advocate on your behalf. Send them little jokes, inspiring quotes, recipes, even stories are a gift, especially mysteries that the donor can help solve because that feels really satisfying or where they can be the hero that gives the story the happy ending. Okay, the next persuasion principle is commitment. People tend to commit when they're presented with an idea or an appeal that fits their self image. And this is also called foot in the door because people who make a commitment tend to follow through and then repeat their past behaviors because of this deep need to be perceived as consistent. So it's a decision making shortcut. If you thank and remind past donors of their previous giving and impact, they're going to think, oh, I already made that decision. I should make that again. I, I want to be consistent with myself. I don't have to do the hard work now to determine whether or not I should or shouldn't participate. I already have a foot in the door. Now it's just a question of how much. And so one folks, once folks have committed to you in this way, they're more likely to continue. What commitments can you secure? All right, so if you can get people committed at an entry level, they're more likely to recommit at higher levels. So online, you can ask for likes and follows, but you don't wanna stop there because you're after engagement that's gonna convert them to the actions you want them to take. So once they've said yes to following you, ask them to retweet you or share your video, and then ask them to do something else, like making a pledge or contacting their congressperson and so on. Um, you can ask them to join and play a game. That's fun. You can ask them to join your email list. You can ask them to take a survey. Offline, the simplest thing you can do is remind folks they've given to you or attended your event or volunteered or signed your petition, anything they did in the past. Um, and once you've got a baseline connection to people, then you just guide prospects through a series of moves or touches. You're familiar with that probably from major gifts moves management that gradually request increasing levels of commitment. So here's an online pledge that we did when I was the director of development at the San Francisco Food Bank, where you know, basically we asked people to take a food for all pledge by simply clicking a button and adding their name. And then the next step 
was to share that with their online networks. So it's a really simple foot in the door strategy that makes people feel committed. Okay, we've looked at reciprocity and commitment. The next persuasion button you can push is social proof. People do what they observe others doing. And that's why using testimonials on your website and in your fundraising appeals can be powerfully persuasive. I mean, it's frankly why people buy Twitter followers. I'm not suggesting that you do that, but you know, it works. When, when people believe that their peers approve of you, they'll be more likely to approve of you as well. Folks look to the wisdom of the crowd in making up their own minds. So when you can say things like, people like you give this much, that really helps. Um, that's the power of Yelp. It mitigates risk. It serves as a built-in decision-making shortcut. So whether online or offline, we use social proof every day to make low risk decisions when we don't have the whole story. Uh, so offline, you can invite prospects to events where they can rub shoulders with their peers. You can ask board members, committee leaders, donors to invite their friends to attend with them because people will more likely say yes to people that they know and like. At the event, you can have current supporters give testimonials as to how they first got involved with you. I've done whole volunteer recognition events where that was the entire program for the event. People just standing up and talking about why they continue to do this. So in other words, you're having them show your new guests or attendees why they are very much like them. This is sort of monkey see, monkey do. Another thing you can do is, is tell donors, tell board members, what are, what are other board members giving? Tell banks what other banks are sponsoring your event and so on. Online, invite people to give you testimonials and use them frequently. Ask for feedback on your articles. Ask current supporters to talk about you in their personal social media channels and ask volunteers to review their experience on Yelp and then collect all of these and sprinkle testimonials throughout your website. This is the greatest investment I ever made. Staff really knows what they're doing. They use my money wisely. I know my gift goes directly to help people in need. I always receive reports demonstrating impact and so on. Next button to push, authority. Folks inherently trust and follow authority figures. And these may be folks they perceive as experts on a subject or maybe having some social status. So I love this one. I recently watched a video of a well-dressed man in a suit jaywalking and everyone on the street corner followed. They all jaywalked across the street. But when the same man wore a sweatshirt, no one followed them. And that's the principle of authority at work. And it's why celebrity and expert endorsements are used to promote products. And you can do this too. And you can also work to establish yourself as a thought leader in your field. So let's look at some ways to do that. So think about who has credibility in your community or area of expertise. And then you want to think, uh, seek out those credible, reassuring influencers to promote your product. So when I was at the food bank, we found out it was mommy bloggers and food bloggers because they cared about food and um, people seemed to, you know, just trust them. Uh, so they could reassure people that they should make this decision to support this organization. You can also establish yourself as a thought leader by initiating discussions on platforms like LinkedIn or Twitter. You can include staff credentials on your website. Uh, you can maybe include short bios. Um, links to published articles or research that staff have done. 
offline, you can invite respected authorities to attend events, address the crowd, join panels, be interviewed, answer questions. Caveat, these should really be people who are truly admired, not just politicos who attend every single event. And if you have a celebrity or an expert endorse you or sign your fundraising letter, often it lifts response. And of course, it's something that you can test. All right, next principle is liking. If you like someone, you're more likely to be influenced by them. Uh, and in Influence by Robert Cialdini, he lists five factors that power the principles of liking. And a couple of them are physical. Um, that, so I don't think that they really apply here so much, but good looks to people suggest other favorable traits like honesty and trustworthiness. And I mean, that's why they put like a, a sexy model next to a car because they think, you know, you're going to like the car better because of that. But the three ones in the middle, similarity, people like us. So you want to show that the values you enact are the values that your constituents share. Compliments, this is a big one. We love praise. We tend to like those who give it to us. And contact and cooperation. We feel a sense of community when we're working with others to fulfill a common goal. So it's really just like being genuine and human on your website and in your appeals to enable people to connect with you, see you're similar to them. Uh, if you get to know your supporters better, familiarity fosters likability. So do more in-person visits or Zoom visits or phone calls, send surveys, dialogue on social networks. You need to listen and then be responsive to people. And essentially this just boils down to being donor centered in everything that you do. Online tips to get people to like you, again, is to develop this offline, I mean, organization wide customer service culture. Every interaction your donor has with anyone in your organization has significance. Donors don't distinguish between the receptionist and the director of development. If someone is rude to them, they're going to remember this. Flatter people. Say nice things in your appeals and thank you letters. Do this repeatedly, not just once. Liking is a process. Tell people they're your heroes. Don't make it all about you and your organization. And don't use jargon. Don't use formal speech. Be warm. Online, you want to have a positive, active social presence. Folks interact online. It's our virtual water cooler. And it's, you know, it's fun. You want to be fun to hang out with. You want to have a friendly human voice. You also want to use a lot of people pictures, especially faces. People like to see other people, and studies show that the highest converting images are those that show faces. And you want to make people smile with your little gifts of content. You want to delight them unexpectedly. And of course, you want to make it easy for people to interact with you. Okay, the next principle is scarcity. So Robert Cialdini found that when folks believe they're going to miss out on something, they're wired to do anything they can to avoid this loss. Perceived scarcity fuels demand. And it's also called FOMO, fear of missing out. So people stand in line to buy Apple phones, to buy Nike sneakers, to buy Harry Potter books, because they might run out. We want more with, of what there's less of. So it's important to be perceived as precious and sought after. And there's a number of ways to do this, both online and off. Offline, you know, you can send an event invitation that offers an intimate, exclusive meeting with someone that's desirable. Let people know 
space is extremely limited, first come, first serve. Perhaps mention that previous events filled up fast. Do something like the first hundred donors at $1,000 get plaques with their name on the theater's chairs. You don't want to miss this once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, so you need to just let people know that your event may sell out, your grant, your, your grant might run out, your challenge might run out, the donor wall may soon be filled up. Act now or you're going to miss out. Um, you know, get their year end tax deduction. Uh, the first 25 who retweet your advocacy alert will be entered in a raffle to win a prize from your sponsor. And so on. You don't want to let them put down your call to action without responding. You worked really hard to trigger their emotions. You want to strike before their ardor cools off. And scarcity works really well, as does another related influence and decision making trigger known as loss aver aversion. And this one comes from psychologist Daniel Kahneman, who you may be familiar with. He's famous for loss aversion experiments that demonstrate how much people's economic behavior, and that includes philanthropy, is guided by a change of reference point. We would rather choose not to lose over gaining the same thing. In other words, the negative feelings that come from loss are much stronger than the positive ones that come from gain. And in an experiment, they gave people a free cup, and then they asked what they would charge to sell it. And they would charge more than they would pay to just buy the cup. So it was worth more to them not to lose it than to get it. And so when you suggest to people that they give something up in order to do good, they have a lot of difficulty doing that. And I often see nonprofits say, give up your latte for a week. I see major gift solicitors say, give till it hurts. That doesn't work. We know donors give because they want to make a positive impact. And so it should be more that we're thinking, give till it feels good. And it can really help when you frame your fundraising offer within this context of pain versus gain, because human beings are wired to make this loss versus gain calculation. So you begin by showing people what they have to lose by not giving, and then how they can prevent this loss. And what they generally don't want to lose is hope hope that their gift will make a meaningful difference. Hope is a powerful emotion. And in its absence, it's really hard for people to feel good. A litany of benefits won't prompt, prompt action as strongly as demonstrating the enormous pain that can be avoided if the donor gives. So, your job is to help people avoid pain. So if you respond now, the loss is not going to occur. Otherwise, it will. And you tell a story and you show photos of the bad stuff ahead, unless they ameliorate this crisis of suffering. They respond to the emergency. They help you keep your doors open. They, they help you get people off the street before the cold weather arrives. So I want to look at an experiment about loss aversion. This is a little tricky. So scientists ask people to imagine preparing for the outbreak of a disease expected to kill 600 people. And if program A was adopted, 200 would be saved. And if program B was adopted, there was a third probability that 600 people will be saved, and a two-third probability that no people would be saved. So I'm going to ask you to chat which you would choose into the chat box. And maybe, Anne, you could kind of 
let me know what people are saying. Uh, a lot of A's coming in. Option A, 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 one B, lots of majority are A's and a okay. handful, count on well, one you're, hand. You're with the people in the experiment. 72% chose A, save the 200. Avoid the risk of losing everyone, even if there's a third chance of saving all 600. So the pleasure from the potential greater gain is dwarfed by the pain of certain loss of 400. Okay, here's another one. They also asked people about two other programs. If program C is adopted, 400 people will die. If program D is adopted, there's a third probability nobody will die, and two third probability all 600 people will die. Okay, chat your choice. Okay, we have a lot of D's, Claire. A lot uh, of D's. Maybe, uh, one, yeah. Okay. And uh, again, a handful of C's, just a few. 78% chose D, and Let's look at this more closely so you can see how framing significantly impacts people's choices. So you may have noticed that program A and C were the same and B and D were the same. All that changes is the framing device. So people hate the option of C, the certainty that 400 people will die and they hate the option of B because they can't securely lock in gains. So the big takeaway here is that people faced with choices involving gains are often risk averse. We will lock in sure wins, but we will take risks, in other words, donate more money to avoid sure losses. So consider using the loss frame when expressing the outcome of not donating to your cause, rather than what people will gain by donating. The certainty of the loss is key. And pain doesn't mean large numbers. In fact, showing one certain loss is better than a multitude. So here, don't let abdomen die. Donate X amount. Instead of donate $50 to save abdomen, it's subtle but it's not clear she'll die otherwise. Whereas the lost frame is quite clear, so it's harder to say no to. And an important nuance on this is, if you tell one story of certain loss, that's better than sharing overwhelming numbers. And what comes into play here is an experiment known as the identifiable victim effect which is research I'll get to in a moment, but the key is you don't wanna trigger feelings of hopelessness. You don't wanna to show too much potential loss. People will give generously to avoid loss when they think they realistically can do it. But if you trigger feelings of hopelessness by depicting loss on an immense scale, then pain begins to seem unavoidable. And you don't want the donor to feel, even if they give, there's still going to be great pain. Such a fundraising offer is often perceived as drop in the bucket. The donor feels the gift they've been asked for will be small, meaningless, what's the point? It's not satisfying to give $10 to help 24,000 starving children. It's more satisfying to give $10 to help one malnourished child avoid the pain of starvation. So let me tell you about this um, identifiable victim effect experiment by Paul Slovic to show how subtle factors affect how people gauge the impact of their gift. So in this one, they partnered up with um, Save the Children 2007 and told a story about an individual child in need and people donated an average of $2.38. Then they did a fact-based appeal about numbers of children in need. People gave an average of $1.14, so less than half. Because the data is hard to grasp, it's boring. 
the average person doesn't care about the concentration of E. coli in an aquifer, but they'll do everything in their power to avoid poop in their tap water. So you might think that combining data with story of an individual person would be the best, but it didn't work. Combining yielded a dollar and 43, and people were moved again by the individual child's story, but when they read the numbers, they felt overwhelmed by the scope of the problem. So narrative beats numbers every time. People respond to numbers they can grasp, but not huge numbers. And that leads to something called scope insensitivity. And you know, Lenin said, if only one man dies of hunger, that is a tragedy. If millions die, that's only statistics. Mother Teresa said, if I look at the mass, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. So you want to factor this in to your messaging very thoughtfully. Okay, let's look at the next decision-making shortcut and tool, which is anchoring. So the human brain compares subsequent options with the one that came first and uses that as a means to make judgments and get the best deal. Um, so that first piece of information is the anchor and sets the tone for everything that follows. And Daniel Kahneman and his partner, Amos Tversky, did a 1974 paper, Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, finding that anchoring works best when consumers lack solid evidence or knowledge about what is appropriate or expected. So in fundraising, if they don't know the appropriate amount or the amount you expect from them, it's really important you give them a clue an anchor. And numerous experiments since this research have validated this anchoring effect. I just like this experiment done with a menu at a, at a bar, and this was for sales of beer. And they presented a menu to customers based on price in two ways, from low to high and high to low. And thanks to doing nothing more than presenting choices in a certain order, the bar made an average of 24 cents more every time someone ordered beer because people read prices from top to bottom. And in the high to low list, they see the higher price beers first. These initial prices serve as anchors that influence their eventual, eventual choice. Um, and changing the order of beer resulted in a 4% increase in revenue. So if your website pulls in $500,000, 4% would be $20,000. So you wonder, would changing the order of donation amounts get you that much or more? You won't really know unless you test. And I'm going to say that's really important because there was a recent test conducted by Next After that showed what I considered a surprising result. They worked with Caring Bridge and they tried low to high and high to low and their takeaway was that high to low yielded a, a decrease in the numbers of donations and in the average gift resulting in over 25 percent decrease in revenue why well their takeaway was that the high to low arrangement subtly communicated that smaller gifts were not welcome and that people interpret the first option as what is desirable and acceptable. So if your donor wants to give $50, sees you appreciate $50, as well as increasing sizes of gifts, they might just decide to upgrade and send you $75. But if they see that anything under $50 is kind of chop liver to you, they might think that adding the incremental $25 won't much matter because all you really notice is the big gifts. On the other hand, this was just one test. So, you know, I'm seeing a lot of charities trying both of these things. And, you know, numbers kind of act as psychological magnets or frames. So you could circle a mid range option, like here, $250, on your remit piece to use as an anchor that causes people to consider it as a baseline. 
or online you can pre-select uh, an amount or fill in, a, fill in a, a radial button or something like that. I'm guessing the higher anchors within reason will tend to lead toward higher gifts, but it is a process of experimenting with different anchors. And you know, you can kind of flip the concept. For example, instead of increasing your event ticket price, you could get a larger venue this year, get a sponsor and reduce the price, and then point out how thankful you are to the sponsor for making it possible for folks to attend this year at a discounted rate. So they feel like they got a deal. And this might also trigger reciprocity, make it more likely since you did a favor that they'll spend more at your on-site auction or your raffle. All right, on to number nine, priming. Well, this one is really fun. So at a wine store, they played French music. And when they played French music, they sold more French wine. When they played German music, they sold more German wine. So priming is kind of like reciprocity, but it's more sense-based. Um, and um, the stimulus can be auditory, visual, tactile, whatever. And it tends to prime you, or Cialdini recently added another uh, principle of influence to his original six, which is called presuasion, which is kind of a melding of priming and reciprocity. So let's take a look at presuasion. And what he said is it's about time which really comes down to the moment before we deliver our message, what he called privileged moments, when we know, uh, if we know what to put in that moment before we deliver our message to ready the individual, to make that person more receptive to what we're about to say, we gain a new dimension of leverage. So if you just go to someone and say, would you consider a gift to our annual campaign? And the person's thinking, you thanked me a year ago, I haven't heard from you, what have you done for me lately? They're not gonna be persuaded. Uh, so recency is key and there's two factors in play. It's what you do, a favor, and what you show, a priming element. And this is immediately preceding your message in those privileged moments to lead people in an aligned direction. So first let's look at the doing. So uh, you're thinking I need to ask for a gift tomorrow. So you go, oh, I'm gonna send this article. I know you're interested in dolphins, so here you go. And then the donor goes, wow, that's so nice of you to remember and thinks I should give to that program again the next time that they ask. And according to Cialdini's research, the favor that you give must be unexpected, not part of what's usually done in exchanges between people, and customized or personalized to that individual's needs and challenges. So let's look at some of some experiments where this was put into play. This one was in a fast food restaurant and researchers, as people came in, they had the manager greet each third of the patrons differently. So one third were warmly greeted and then ushered over to the counter where they could order food. The second third were greeted, given a small gift, a nice key ring when they came in and then ushered over to the counter where they ordered 12% more food because they were given something and they wanted to give back. And the third cohort were given a cup of yogurt and then ushered to the counter. They purchased 24% more because they were given the most meaningful favor for folks coming into a restaurant, free food. So they purchased double what the people who were given the less meaningful gift purchased. Let's look at a showing experiment. So in this one, 
Cialdini's researchers arranged to send website visitors to one of two landing pages with different backgrounds. And this was for a furniture show, uh, store. So one was wallpaper with pictures of fluffy clouds, and the other was wallpaper with pictures of coins. And the cloud visitors proceeded to search the website for the most comfortable furniture. And the coin visitors searched for the most inexpensive furniture. So what could your nonprofit potentially do? Well, Cialdini actually did this experiment for a nonprofit. Uh, it was a university and they had a group of students assigned to call alumni donors. And half of the students were given a plain sheet of paper with talking points, like on the left. And the other half were given the same talking points, but there was a picture of a runner winning, winning a race at the top of the page. And the callers who had the photo collected 60% higher donations, which I find astounding. The imagery that the callers saw persuaded them to make a more compelling pitch that would win the race. And once the callers were pumped up, the donors could achieve a contact high. So I would suggest that when you go to make fundraising calls next time, you paste a compelling image on your computer or next to your phone. Uh, Cialdini reports research that when people are, are shown a picture of Rodin's The Thinker statue, they become more thoughtful. So consider the mood you want to invoke and use imagery to pe persuade yourself to do exactly that. The other priming experiments and tips let a smile be, be your umbrella. On the right, this person is showing a, a smile. And when you put a smile on your face, when you talk on the phone, people will give more money. And there's, there's research on that too. People can even tell the, the size of your smile from how your voice sounds. Um, on the left, handing a person a warm beverage at the beginning of a meeting causes them to describe you as a warm person. So you primed them to like you. And back to the other picture, you see this blonde woman is sitting to the left of the prospect. And if you approach from the left, they found you have a greater influence on people's emotions. So it's just fascinating research and you can read more about it in these three books, Persuasion by Robert Cialdini, The Psychology, of Influence and Persuasion by Cialdini, and Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And now I wanna look at one final psychological neuroscience influencer uh, as we delve a bit into how the brain works. And this is emotional cues. Um, we wanna be generous with what we know triggers empathy. And that's emotional cues like stories and visuals. So of course you remember the difference between irrational humans and logical Vulcans on Star Trek. Human behavior is ruled by emotions much more than logic. When we receive an appeal, we don't think long and hard. We decide quickly. And if we think it's just to justify our decision made with emotion. So you don't want to count on people reasoning things through. Reason can't work absent emotion. So you want to tell stories. Again, I could talk for hours on storytelling, but we're wired that way. There's another wonderful book by Lisa Krohn, K-R-O-N, called Wired for Story. So whenever I open a fundraising letter that doesn't begin with a story, my heart really sinks because I know it's not going to be as successful as it should be pictures, the human brain retains images better than anything else. You don't have long to make a first impression. People make decisions within four seconds. So having that photo is really important. And again, when I see an appeal that doesn't have a nice compelling photo, again, it makes me really wanna cry. So let's look quickly at how seeing is believing. This famous experiment they gave um, noted enologist, wine snobs, 
white wine with red food coloring. And these experts then described the wine and they used all the words you would use to describe a red wine without ever noting that it was white. So if you ever need to explain to someone in your office about the importance of using visuals, try this experiment. And it's because the brain processes olfactory cues like taste and smell approximately 10 times slower than sight. So if you remember nothing else from today, put visuals everywhere. Visuals that tell a story. Seeing is believing. And let's look at how this translates to philanthropy based on how our brains take in emotional cues. So the, it's the primitive brain that controls emotions and behavior and decision making. And there are these three neurochemical drivers of happiness that have been called the happiness trifecta that are deep within. And because human beings are social animals, we're wired to help one another. So you may have heard of the MRI experiments where just contemplating thinking, uh, giving, gives people a dopamine rush. Um, they call this the warm glow effect. And dopamine is what's connected to motivation and arousal. Similarly, reading a story or watching a play makes us feel empathy or giving because we get an oxytocin boost. It's known as the cuddle hormone. It's among the most ancient of our neurochemicals, has a powerful effect on brain and body. And when it begins to flow, bonding increases, trust and empathy are enhanced. And finally, oxytocin releases serotonin, which is connected to sleep, appetite, digestion, memory, learning. And it makes us more passionate. It frees up our willingness to make passionate gifts. And just a bit more on oxytocin, there's this great book by Paul Zak called The Moral Molecule. Because when oxytocin is present, it motivates people to show kindness to others. And he found that higher levels of oxytocin in the bloodstream is associated with significantly higher desire to give to a charitable cause. So again, people don't process abstractions and generosity, um, generalities well. And about 85% of fundraising letters I see are abstractions and generalities. But a compelling story with an emotional trigger will alter brain chemistry, making the people more empathic and open. So I commend you to this book and remind you again that your goal, whether you know it or not, and now you do, is to release oxytocin. So you wanna use real stories about real people to trigger empathy, not abstract prose about giving donations for needy people. It's very difficult for most of us to donate to faceless entities, but we will open our wallet for people we see are in need. And this is because of mirror neurons. If you ever see someone accidentally cut themselves and then hear yourself exclaiming, ouch, this reaction is caused by mirror neurons in your brain. It makes you feel you're actually experiencing what you see. So you want to help people feel the experience. You want to trigger the phenomena of there, but for the grace of, go I, which plays to people's empathy on a gut level and makes them want to act. So I really encourage you to use some of these shortcuts to get more people to respond to your calls to action and influence your supporters to do what presumably they already want to do. Remember, most people want to make our world a better, more caring place. So if you're influencing people to do something positive that they're already predisposed to do, something that matches their values and makes them feel good, that's a fine thing. Using the science of persuasion and principles of influence is neither sleazy nor Machiavellian. Your ends are not evil. 
You're just trying to make the best of limited resources and cut through the clutter. And if you can use shortcuts to grab people's attention and persuade them to act, then your organization can benefit significantly and your donors will feel good too, which is a win-win. So thank you, Bloomering, for having me today. I don't know if we have time for questions. I'm willing to stay on a little late. And if people have a burning question and want me to answer it, get in contact with me, email me. I'm happy to answer. Thanks, Claire. We do have time for about a few questions. We've got a few that have come in. So let's jump in. There's been some good dialogue here, too, with just using imagery but not exploiting so i've got a question here from jennifer how do you use the loss aversion technique without victimizing the person you're already helping and then she goes on to say we want to avoid kind of the the aspca type ads that we see on on television yeah well i mean again i would say you can't think about this in terms of what you you feel is manipulative or sleazy. You have to think about it in terms of the research and how the brain works. So if people feel like they, if they don't help, then a dog is going to suffer, then that's really what you want to key into. Um, and I, I think you can make it very simple and very black and white. The very best fundraising appeals force donors to make a black and white decision. If I help this, if I don't help that. And yeah, they might feel bad if they don't help, but if they don't help you, that doesn't really matter to you that much. So, you know, it's okay if they don't wanna help animals, it doesn't make them a bad person. But for the people who really care about that, who really are animal lovers and are putting themselves in a way in these animals shoes, you want them to really feel that. It's great. Um, got another question uh, from Karen. Should you combine as many of these persuasion techniques or do they cancel each other out, becoming confused or overused? So I use on the techniques. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, you know, when you get used to it, you'll find yourself using them naturally. And some of them you're going to use a lot more frequently than others. Reciprocity is a big one. Liking is a big one. So I would say, you know, start simple, you know, start with, I mean, I find very few nonprofits use, use, uh, gratitude and flattery enough. They feel like, oh, they're just gushing. And people love the gushy thank yous for the most part. I mean, I used to get people telling me, oh, Claire, that was the nicest thank you I've ever received. People would give to me because of the thank you letters. And and it's like you 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 would gush when you talk to a friend, but you don't gush when you talk to a donor. You keep it all businesslike. And that keeps people really at arm's length. So, you know, I wouldn't worry about thinking all the time about like what wallpaper can we put behind the landing page to incline people. But if you're a larger nonprofit, you can start playing around because you've got more people and more time to start thinking, oh, you know, it might might make a difference if we put hearts here. I've always thought it's very interesting that there's hearts in a lot of nonprofit logos. And I think in a way that predisposes people to want to be kind and, and generous. There's a, a nonprofit here locally, Project Open Hand, that started out delivering meals to people with AIDS. And their logo is a warm meal and then the steam comes up and flows into a heart shape. And it's just little subtle things like that, but it kind of gets your juices flowing to start thinking about things that you could do, but certainly don't worry about combining them all. That would be, that would drive me insane. That would be hard to manage. Uh, we've got one, uh, Ginny asked, uh, you know, some of this feels so counterintuitive to me. Is there a good book? Now you recommended a couple good books. Are there any other good books about this kind of messaging for fundraisers or class that 
uh, we should be thinking about? Um, you know, uh, Jen Cheng at the uh, Institute for, for, for Sustainable Philanthropy in the UK offers a course once or twice a year on the psychology of fundraising. And this is kind of a new field, but I think they are actually offering a degree or a certification in psychology of fundraising. So I think that would be an interesting thing. But I mean, start with Robert Cialdini. I mean, when I first discovered Robert Cialdini, I was kind of blown away that I didn't know about all of this research before. Um, if you can get to the point where you know this stuff backwards and forwards, you will start to find yourself doing it. You know, it will be, start to become like a part of a, your language. It's like learning a new language and you will find that you're just starting to do it or you'll recognize it. And, you know, you can look at your fundraising letter and go, oh, we don't have any anything in here like this. But I mean, even if you just remember things like storytelling, read Lisa Crone's book, Wired for Story. Um, there's so much that shows how important storytelling is. And it's why it's become this really big buzzword in marketing and in fundraising. Um, and go back and look at your fundraising letter. Do you tell a story? I mean, I could talk about that for, for, for ages, but you know, sometimes there'll be a little wisp of a story buried down there in your second or third paragraph where no one will ever notice it. But you got to start by telling the story. That's what's going to capture people's attention. Claire, that's a great call out. I was um, I've taken teams through storytelling exercises and had the luxury of working with Chip Heath, who's a well known author. He has a book called Made to Stick um, yeah. and Dan Heath. But the, the work that we went through on the marketing team to just get to the story, to the colorful, you know, rich um, words we use to describe and details that we would normally leave out, those are the things that make the story. So it, it, it's, it was a really surprising exercise. Um, yeah. Yeah, we've got one more one more question here that was filtered in through the Q and A. Um, just the the idea of how does the warm glow effect work alongside more negative emotions like those related to scarcity and loss aversion? Well, they're they're both related to those primitive neurochemicals in our brain. So you've got all three of them there sort of in a, in a stew. And the warm glow, you can feel a warm glow when you decide to give to prevent a loss. So just thinking about giving kind of gives you a warm glow. And then getting over the, the, the hump to kind of like, well, Am I going to give? How much am I going to give? Oh, well, this is what will be lost if I don't give. You know, so it's like you're piling on a little bit. Um, you don't have to do all of them, but if you can think when you're writing from that, what would the donor lose if they didn't give, as opposed to here's all the good things that will ensue. People will be happy and you'll be happy and we'll be happy because we'll have more money and it's really good. Um, some people will respond to that, but what you're really trying to go after is how do we get the most people to respond? And not every appeal lends itself as well to things like loss aversion as others, but loss aversion works really well in, in a crisis, in an emergency. So you know, you're thinking about giving, you already know giving is going to make you feel good, but how is it going to be the best? Well, I'm going to, you know, keep this person from being on the streets by giving them housing because their house just burned down, you know. That's great. Know. It's not intuitive, all of it. I think testing and, you know, takes practice. And, uh, yeah, it takes practice. It. Everything takes practice. Yep, yep. And keep refining and improving. Um, you know, getting started is the best thing you can do, uh, and then keep refining and practicing and improving. Um, so with that, we have hit our time, and I want to be mindful of everyone's schedule. We it looks like we have 
we, we one more snuck in best strategy for a new nonprofit trying to fundraise and reach new donors. Um, do we have time for that or should we do uh, take that one offline and do an ask, ask an expert of what's the best strategy for a new nonprofit trying to fundraise and reach new donors? Yeah, that's a pretty huge, huge question. <laughs> that's like covers the gamut of everything that you can do. But but I would, you know, I would just close um, with saying, first of all, if you want, if you sign up for my newsletter, if you aren't already on there, because you'll get a free donor thank you calls book and script. And one of the best things that you can do, new or old nonprofit, is thank people more. And calling people and thanking them is one of these unexpected favors that you do people. It delights them. They don't expect it. It feels warm and personal. So please get that. It's free. And you can get tons more great content from me if you enroll in Clarification School. Recently, I've been writing a lot about storytelling, and now I'm writing about annual appeals. So um, those things might help you too, especially if you're new. And then just remember that Philanthropy really is the gentle art of teaching the joy of giving. And if you want gifts, you must give them. I always say that. Sometimes they're overt, sometimes they're subtle, but they all move your donor to the same place, which is what Maya Angelou talks about. It's a joyful, liberated place that gives their life greater meaning. So thank you again, all of you, for doing this important work and making our world a better and more caring place. What a beautiful way to end our session today, Claire. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to everybody for your attentiveness, your participation. What a wonderful community. Uh, we run these webinars every Thursday next week, we have Megan Amundsen talking about building a board of fundraising pros. So building off of what Claire just wrapped up with today, um, you know, please join us, check it out. Um, we're here to help all nonprofits thrive. Claire, thank you again for, for your insight. And we wish everyone that you're healthy and well and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.